So today, as you know, I'm going to talk about uh, some issues with our national parks with regard to elephants. First of all, uh, I'll share some rather disturbing images with you. These are images from Yala. Uh, that's an adult female, and that's a baby. She didn't survive. This is a juvenile of about uh, four years of age. Uh, this is another young baby. These are images from the Galge area, also part of the Yala National Park complex. As you see, the common thread through all of these is that all these elephants are in very bad body condition. They are emaciated, and they are like walking skeletons. And these are from Udawalwe National Park. This was actually uh, picked up by some uh, foreigners who came here as visitors, and they queried what was going on. OK, so clearly, there is some thing wrong here, some issue under food. So what are the issues? So let's first take a look at what's wrong with Yala National Park. Yala, we are, when we refer to Yala, we generally refer to Yala Block 1. So this is the Yala Block 1 area. And then outside that, the, what I overlaid in red is the developed area, where, which is highly populated. Here is the Salt Corporation, and the WNPS bungalow is somewhere here. And then outside the boundary of the Yala Block 1 is the forest department area extending from Vadihitikanda to Nimalava. There used to be elephants in this entire area, and some of these elephants used to go into this developed area and cause human elephant conflict. This forest department area, there's a lot of chena cultivation or slash and burn cultivation. And when the people cultivate, the elephants go into the park. And when they finish the cultivation and come back, go to their villages, the elephants used to come into this area. In 2001, the elephants were chased in, and an electric fence was put up. This is the electric fence, uh, some, somewhat between the wildlife department and the forest department area. However, there were two waterways here, which the elephants still used to cross the fence. And they continued with their uh, historical activity of moving in and out of the park. So with season, they used to go into the park. And then if you look at this is uh, research that we used to do at that time. We used to do what are called line transects. That is, you walk through the forest in a line and count the number of elephant droppings or dung piles that are there. That gives you an idea of how many elephants are there. So elephant dung density used to be quite high in the wet season. It used to be low and quite high in the dry season. And also, by observation, what we thought was that there were about 150 to 200 elephants that were coming out of the park during this dry season into the what, was, what we call the buffer zone, but it's not a declared buffer zone which is about two-thirds of the elephants in block one. <clears throat> now, in 2004, two people got killed here by elephants. Emotions ran very high. Uh, there were other nefarious uh, people who got uh, involved in that, like poachers. And as a result of that, on the day of the second person's funeral, a mob got together and went and attacked the wildlife department office. The department people shot at them in self-defense, and one person got killed. So after that, there was like a war between the village and the department. And finally, it was resolved by the department agreeing to again chase the elephants into the park, next please, and closing the fence. And that was done in 2004. This is a young male that we were tracking. He was about uh, five, six years of age, so he was still part of the group. We had a radio collar on him. Uh, together with the wildlife department, uh, we put the collar. And when we looked at their home range, so th this is the GPS data. Each dot represents the GPS position for that animal, which represents, in turn, the ranging pattern of the of his herd, of his group. So, this is now the electric fence. And they used to use some area inside the park, but the large area outside the park. So if you look at their home range, Carvan's home range, 
about 75% or three quarters of it was outside the park. Now, after the elephants were driven in and the fence was closed, in 2006, an elephant was found stuck in the mud in the Bambova tank, which is close to the boundary of the park. And together with the department people, we went to see, and that was Kava. He was emaciated, he was so weak, he couldn't stand. So we, because we had followed him for a couple of years, we kind of felt very close to him, and we couldn't just watch. So with the wildlife department officers, we tried to feed him. Lying like this, he ate more than 50 kilos of food a day. He was almost like a tame elephant because he was suffering so much. But he was too far gone. And in spite of the efforts of the veterinarians in the department, he died uh, after three days. So Kawan's home range, his herd's home range, was something like this. It was about 100 square kilometers. But if you look at the protected area, the Yala protected area complex, it is connected to the Lunugam Mehra National Park. This complex is about 1,500 square kilometers. Next, please. So we drove the elephants in here and put up the electric fence on the boundary. So this herd could go anywhere and start a new home range. But they didn't do that. They stayed very close to the fence in a very small area and suffered the consequences. This is another female that was collared at that time, Bisomenike. She had a home range which was about half outside the park and half inside the park. So next, same story, we put up the, drove the elephants inside, put up the electric fence on the boundary of the park. And they could also go anywhere in this huge area and start a new home range, but again didn't do that. Stayed restricted to a very small area next to the fence and suffered the consequences. This is Bissau Manike, six months after she was stuck inside the fence. She had a baby in 2005 and the baby died in 2007. That was her first baby. These are the elephants, babies, and young ones that we found dead while we were doing uh, transects in that area. Not particularly looking for elephant uh, carcasses, but by accident, what we came across within about six months after the drive. So a number of elephants, mostly young ones, died during this period. OK, so that was way back in 2004, 5, 6. What's the situation now? This is, again, now a little bit dated, in 2013. So here we are comparing the body condition. The body condition is a measure of how healthy animals are. So we give a visual score. If the body condition is high, the score is from 0 to 10. If it is high, that means they are in very good health. If it is low, maybe there is a problem. So this is comparing two parks, Lunugam Mehra and Yala National Park, together with an outside area, that's the Valaway Left Bank area, that is the Hambantot area. So the elephants here, by this time, were having a lot of human-elephant conflict. They were having a lot of issues, a lot of infrastructure development. Here, the elephants did not have any human-elephant conflict. But if we compare the body condition of males or juveniles or females, in all these cases, the body condition of the animals in these two parks was much less than the animals that were outside. And if you look at the number of juveniles per adult female, which again is a measure of the reproductive activity and the health of the population, in Lunugam Mehera and Yala, the number of juveniles per adult female was less than one, which means those are declining population. So healthy populations should have a juvenile to adult female ratio of about 1.8 to 2 juveniles per adult female. So the Wallaway left bank, in contrast, at about 1.7. Again, then these are Bissau Manike, the female that we were tracking earlier and whose first baby died, had another baby in January 2011. This is Bissomanike and the baby. And he died in 
September 2012. So this female lost her first baby and the second baby, the two consecutive births, she lost the calf. Now this is Gamunu's group. Gamunu, as you know, I think all of you are probably uh, people who go to Yala. Gamunu, you probably know personally, the big tusker who's there now. He was born and, he, and grew up inside Yala. So this group, actually, we have been studying from 1993, so almost more than 20 years. So we have very good information on this group. This is the group that Gamunu was originally born into. We have tracked a number of females in this herd, and this herd never ever went out of the park. Their entire home range was inside the park. But these are young ones of Gamunu's herd that have died. So this is Ramsa. Uh, he died in 2005. This is Ruchi, uh, UNI size 5. She died in 2006. Dandi died in 2007. Mini died in 2007. Deborah died in 2009. She was died very young. Doty died in 2011. Shorty in 2012. Rana in 2012. This is a tusker that again you probably knew in Yala. He died in 2012. Dilini died in 2013. Mandy died in 2014. And the list goes on. In 2013, the Situlpawa priest, seeing the condition of the elephants in Yala, started a feeding program in the dry season. He basically went and dumped uh, coconut and coconut uh, fronds and some vegetable matter. And these herds feasted on that during the dry season. In 2013, if you uh, remember, it was a very dry year, the monsoon failed. And the department also captured two babies from Yala and took them into the ETH. One of them died. Remo, Ruchi is the mother of the, uh, the Tusker, Rana. And Remo was removed in 2014, and he's still at the ETH. Ruchi actually has lost three consecutive calves during this period. OK. So this is the animals that were born into Gamunus group from 1993 till 2014. The ones marked in red are all dead. So if you look at the mortality of calves born after 2002, it's 54%. It's extremely high. Now remember, this is a herd that never ever went out of the park they are suffering the effect of competition from the other herds who used to go out in the dry season and no longer can do so. The impact on those herds is much more, but we don't have such detailed data for those herds. Why is this? The buffer zone where the elephants, that, were, that is what the elephants were denied, is only about 5,000 hectares or five square kilometers. And if you look at the large protected area complex, it's only about 3% of that. How can that make such a big difference? <coughs> Yala is a huge area, 1,500 square kilometers. So how can this small area of about 50 square kilometers make such a big difference? If you look at what goes on there, these are tanks that were there in 2010. Tanks are small reservoirs, freshwater reservoirs. There were 25 tanks in these 50 square kilometers. Today, there are probably 100 because it has accelerated. So there is lots of water in this area. And there is chain or slash and burn agriculture. Every wet season, or just before the wet season, people come there. They cut the scrub, burn it, and then they cultivate through the wet season. And in the dry season, they go back to their villages. In part of that area, we did a survey in 2006 and looked at how many chenas there were. There were 812 chenas in this area. So if you take the entire area up to Vedi Hitikanda, there were probably 1,500 chenas. So each chena is about 2.2 acres. And the total area cultivated was approximately 3,300 acres, or 1,400 hectares. This basically is habitat management for elephants, because 
The difference between this area and the Yala National Park is that in, inside Yala, it's mature forest. So there's very little food for elephants. Whereas outside, because of this Chena or slash and burn agriculture, which we generally think of as a bad thing, because of that, there's a lot of food for elephants. So not only the area cultivated, this is a satellite image of the area. If you look at it closely, you see a reticulate pattern. These are what are known as the pitavetters. Every chena has a pitavetter or a piled up shrub fence around it. And on this, you have a lot of vines and things that are growing again, providing a lot of food for elephants. We estimate that there were about 400 kilometers of such fences in this area. So this is like a supermarket for elephants. OK, so that is what was denied to the elephants. Basically, to prevent or take a measure against human-elephant conflict, we drove the elephants into Yala, close the fence. If you look at the human-elephant conflict side, did that solve the problem? No. Still, today, even today, there are males in this area which break houses, which raid crops, which cause human-elephant conflict. The ones inside, stuck inside Yala are the herds which never did any harm to anybody. So basically, we are punishing the wrong elephants. What are the, what can we do to remedy this? Maybe we can, if this is such a small area and people are doing habitat management, can we do that inside Yala? So if you look at how much of habitat is there, it's about 20 square kilometers that is being cultivated outside the park. The annual cost to do this kind of habitat management inside Yala would be about 10 million rupees per year. And you'd have to do that every year, forever. Logistically, it's simply impossible to do. And then there are also biodiversity concerns because disturbed habitat is better for elephants, but it is not good for many other species. So whichever way you look at it, this again is not a possibility. OK, so basically, we still have the elephants inside Yala. They are starving to death. This year was a good year for them. They are in fairly good condition at the end of the dry season this year because there were unseasonal rains. But what we've seen over these past 10 years is that every dry season, the young ones die. They still reproduce, and they don't die immediately. Most of them die after they are weaned. So from two to five years of age, mortality is extremely high. So we can continue with that situation. And as you probably have experienced yourself, today you don't see many elephants in Yala. If you think back 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, we saw many, many more elephants in Yala. So if this continues, Already, there are a couple of generations missing in the herds that are still there. And once the big animals die, that population will completely collapse. And like I mentioned, from the human-elephant conflict side, the males are still here, still causing problems. So both from human-elephant conflict mitigation and from elephant conservation points of view, this is not a good situation. What about Udawalawe? Udawalawe is a uh, somewhat different picture, but there are some commonalities. These are uh, uh, from a master's thesis uh, from Mologoda. This is an interpretation of aerial uh, photographs. The green areas are high forest. This is from 1956. This is from 1973. Much of the high forest is gone. It's converted to grassland and scrub forest. In, by 1983, it was almost all grassland and scrub forest. This was because of the Udwalaya project. There was massive chain of cultivation. There was massive logging that converted the high forest into savanna grassland type of habitat. Even today, you see these giant trees in the middle of the, well, not today, but maybe five, 10 years ago, you saw these giant trees in the middle of the grassland, and these are parts of the big forest that was there. When the water goes down in the reservoir, you can see the giant trees 
that are still standing there. This was all a huge tall canopy forest. This is the image of Budawala Way in 2006, where we were doing some transects. As far as you can see, it's all savanna type of grassland. This is panicum grass or guinea grass. The grass here, you can see it's high as a man. This is in 2010. You can see a change occurring. You can see shrubs coming up. Here again in the grassland, you can now see shrubs coming up in 2010. This is 2015. This is what you see if you go to Udawala Bay now. Those of you who have visited the park 10 years ago, just think back what it was then and what it is now. It's all shrub. All the grasslands are gone. The elephants are still looking for little bits of grass that are here and there. So they still feed in the shrub, the scrub forest areas, but mostly still looking for grass. Next, please. There are still bits of panicum growing among the teak and other teak uh, regrowth and other shrubs. And they search this out. But it is not enough for them. So what's happening here? These are very basic concept in ecology, what is called succession. You have something like a bare rock through time Changes occur because of the life that is around, because of physical factors, and ultimately, slowly, or maybe hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, that is converted to a climax or a high forest. And grasslands are a early stage in this process of succession. This is something that happens continuously. On the other hand, disturbance takes this in the other, man, other way. So you start with a high forest that is there, and you cut the forest, you burn the forest, then it becomes maybe a scrub forest, becomes grasses, and if you continue the disturbance, it will ultimately end up with bare exposed land. So this process takes it the other way. So succession takes it one way, disturbance takes it the other way. So fire is an agent of disturbance, and fire was one of the main things that maintained the savanna grassland in Udwalawi National Park. But of course, as for management, generally we think fire is a bad thing, burns the forest, kills a lot of little things, so we should stop fire. So there's been active fire suppression in this area. But what happens is grasses are adapted to fire. So if there is fire, the grasses burn quickly, the fire is not very hot, and with the next rains, it regenerates. In fact, many of these fires were set by cattle herders because that also provided a lot of luscious, lush grass for cattle. But Udo Alave, there are additional issues. There were very large numbers of cattle. And panicum grass is no very well known to be susceptible to overgrazing. There are also other confounding factors, like lantana, which is taking over some of the grassland. But if you see now, lantana is also getting shaded out. And if this process goes on in Udo Alave, in another 25 years, 50 years, another 100 years, there'll again be a tall forest. The issue is that's not good for elephants. So these are the electric fences around the Udawale National Park. This is an elephant corridor that connects with the Donugamera National Park and in the Yala Park complex. So these electric fences are already in place. The electric fences are what's keeping the elephants inside the park. Research done here by Dr. Sherman Silva, I think in about 2010, um, and also Ashoka, uh, who's here, I think, showed that there were about 1,000 elephants using Udwalawe National Park, more than 1,000 elephants. Such a large number cannot exist only within the park. So most likely at that time, elephants used to use the outside areas that were adjacent to the park. This again is the electric fence. This is the corridor, so-called corridor. And this is the Udwalawe National Park. These are paddy fields in that area. Most of them are seasonally cultivated only one season per year, some two seasons. And these are the developed areas or settlements of people. But all this area that are not that is not colored is actually excellent habitat for elephants. Almost all of it is belongs to the forest department. 
So again, similar to the situation in Yala, we have the forest department area, we have the wildlife department area, we have a fence in between, and here the herds are now imprisoned basically. If panicum grass is susceptible to overgrazing, it's not only overgrazing by cattle, could also be overgrazing by elephants. So they also could have contributed to the current situation. Ashoka did a study last year um, on the Udwalwe National Park boundary, where he fixed three camera traps on the park boundary. Here you see an elephant breaking the fence. This is an adult male. He identified 35 adult males that were going out from this park, this area, not one single female. Again, the same story. We put up these fences to, as a human-elephant conflict mitigation measure. We imprison the herds that don't cause conflict, and they suffer because of that. The males that cause the conflict continue to break these fences and go out and cause conflict. Today, the wildlife department has put up more than 2,500 kilometers of electric fencing as a human-elephant conflict mitigation measure. Unfortunately, about 60% of these fences are like this. The electric fence, these are the Yala fence, by the way. Forest on this side, forest on this side, elephants on this side, elephants on this side. So what is the meaning of such a fence? Like the Berlin Wall, creating West Germany and East Germany, Today we have created wildlife department elephants and forest department elephants. So if you take the case of Udo Alave, uh, there is a lot of habitat in this area that elephants could use that the herds are now denied. So that is the problem in Udo Alave. What can we do? It's not, none of these issues are simple issues. They are very complicated. There are a lot of uh, emotions involved. There's a lot of politics, economic factors. So the problem is that we have put up the electric fence on the boundary of the national park, whereas elephants don't know about this. There's a lot of elephant habitat still outside, which they could use, which is now denied to them. How, can we convert this back to grassland? Again, there are, I couldn't say, no one can really say how you can do that just like that. You probably cannot do it just like that. But once this was high forest, now it is crop forest. This high forest, did get turned into savanna grassland, which was excellent for elephants. It should be possible to convert this back to grassland, but we need to study this and figure out how to do it. There are a lot of number of factors, the elephants, the buffaloes, the cattle, the lantana, the fire, all these have different effects. So the only way to figure that out would be to study that and figure out how we can do that. And in the meantime, the only short-term thing that we could potentially do is allow these herds to, again, go out of the park, but easily said than done, because if you say you, are, you want to remove any of these fences, this fence is in the correct place, this is all developed area, but these fences are all within elephant habitat. If you say you want to remove one of these fences, there will be massive protests. So it's not a, there are no easy solutions. And, uh, but these are things I think that we need to discuss and take policy decisions at the highest level. That is the only way that we can address this problem. It's the wildlife department by itself cannot decide to take down any of these fences. They would not be allowed to do that by the people. For more than 60 years, we have tried to mitigate the human-elephant conflict by pushing the elephants into the national parks under the wildlife department. This is where the elephants are today. More than 70% of elephant range and elephants are still outside the parks. But if we keep doing this, chasing the herds inside and fencing them in, we will turn our national parks into concentration camps for elephants. Thank you.